All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, System Chalk here with what I guess, I don't know, in intermission, an appendix. Um, I'm not quite sure what to call this, but this is between the uh, 10th and the 11th episode. I'm fighting for screen real estate here, unfortunately, but uh, I did want to at least show what I was looking at. So <clears throat> I'm of two minds of where the... Uh, also, by the way, sorry, I this is totally unrelated to the code, but I actually just watched uh, a movie called American Fiction, uh, and I was in hysterics at the end. Um, actually, I mean, throughout the movie, but the, the ending is particularly um, explosive. Uh, so I'm I'm still wiping away tears and otherwise am re reconstituting myself. Very good. Uh, I, I really enjoyed the film. <clears throat> but apologies for the... Uh, how, however that affects the the recording um but yeah so i um i i've got rough working uh there's a couple of other uh, improvements sorry i never like talking when i type in a password because i'm scared to death i'm just gonna say it out there well not i mean <laughs> not that anybody's gonna sign in on that but anyways <clears throat> um but yeah so um there are 446 problems uh, when I open up all of the files. Um, this is because, again, as a learning exercise, I actually don't think it's bad to go for the the really aggressive um, approach. But as I said in that episode, um, I'm not really getting the advantage if you know I, I'm not actually engaging with what it's telling me to do. Uh, and one thing that's I liked about Rough and <clears throat> kind of why I was hoping that it would uh, be working again, despite the fact that obviously this default is is really aggressive in terms of saying uh, what's wrong. Um, it's an opportunity for me to sort of learn, right? So the example I like giving is says, hey, you, you probably shouldn't do print stuff. You should probably put it in a logger or, or something like that. And I'm like, oh, okay, let's take a look at logging. And I'm like, okay, that's a little tough for me to just do right now. I have other priorities, but I think I should take the time to sort of learn how uh, how this works. So um, I don't think that I need to do every single entry. I mean, essentially, this is probably just going to be, you know, for those of you who just happen to like the sound of my voice and just want to have something on the background, this is perfect for that. Um, but I figured... You know, I don't have that many episodes left in the tutorial. And wouldn't it just be nice that when I do the next part that I have a smaller number of problems to deal with? So what I did first was I went through all 446 and I broke them down into the um, the individual categories. And as you can see on my very crowded uh, browser on the right uh, right hand side here, we have the errors. <clears throat> and like I said, there's it doesn't just tell you when things are going wrong, but you can actually follow the links and it will say, you know, what it does, why this is bad and so on and so forth. So this is alphabetically sorted. I no promises that I'm going to get through everything, but uh, what I figured I could do is at the very least try to get through the um, the ones that seem to be obvious, obvious to fix. And then, you know, that will... You know, even if I maybe just go in between uh, recordings or whatever and read up a little bit more on the ones that I don't, um, I don't have a a good gr uh, grasp on, or ones that maybe seem a little too complicated to to do in the context of a video and still be able to complete the tutorial uh, as intended. This seems like a decent little little thing for me to do. And you know, again, like I said, I just saw a good movie. I'm in a good mood, and uh, heaven forbid I you know, try and hang on. I think OBS just added a pause button. Oh, this is going to be very, very helpful for future videos. Um, okay, anyways. <clears throat> so yeah, this is this is going to be what I'm doing. I'm going to be going through... I haven't ordered... I just alphabetically ordered these. Uh, I'm just going to go through them top to bottom. And uh, we will... Um, we'll try and learn a little bit more about Python. So missing return type, undocumented public function uh, from Flake 8 annotations. Fix is sometimes available. What it does, checks that the public, uh, that public functions and methods have return type annotations. So why is it bad that, oh, sorry, I should, um, so ANN201. 
right? So this is just one here. Um, this is main. So why is this bad? Type annotations are good, a good way to document the return types of functions. They also help catch bugs uh, when used alongside a type checker by ensuring that the types of any return values and the types expected by callers match expectation. <clears throat> so this is uh, main here. So the natural question here is, what is this returning? Well, one thing we could do is just take a look, right? Um, and we call it inside main. So I did make a mistake when I first saw this error. Um, <clears throat> and I was thinking, it's like, oh, uh, well, this should probably be like int. Um, and this is sometimes true. There, there are languages in which it returns int. Not here. Uh, I think in this case, it's appropriate to say none. Again, we take a look through this. So we've got a new terminal. Uh, that's our context. We're going inside this. We've got root console, while it's true, um, clear on render presence, right? We're doing things to the context. Um, we are raising exceptions in certain circumstances, but this doesn't seem to be returning anything. Um, right, this is a function that we've made on our own. It doesn't. It's not returning anything. It would seem to me that uh, this would be. All right. So why are you still okay? Missing a doc string. Okay, fair enough. <clears throat> so, and that's it. That's the only instance of this particular um, this particular issue. So we'll get out of there. So now we're on to two o four. A lot of these. Okay. So missing return type for a special method and in two o four fix is sometimes available. Checks that special methods like init, new, and call have return type annotations. Why is this bad? Type annotations are a good way to document return types of functions. They also help catch bugs when used alongside a type checker by ensuring that all that the types of any return values and the types expected by callers match expectation. Note that type checkers often allow you to omit the return type annotation for init methods as long as at least one argument has a type annotation. To opt into this behavior, use the mypy init return setting in your pyproject.toml or rough.toml final or file. Um, now, what I would prefer to do, right? So this is a this is a question of um, this is a question of learning the the language, right? I don't want to just skip this stuff. I actually want to understand, um, you know, when I when I call this, um, what's happening? So here, I would suspect that this is still a nun. Um, I feel a little, um, I guess actually, maybe we'll see something here. I really prefer, oh, I guess the hack for searches now is just to look for Reddit. So uh, do you use none in the init? I'm pretty new to this, just saw this for the first time. Um, I have a stack overflow. Okay, well, if it's quoting documentation, um, as a special constraint on constructors, no value may be returned. Doing so, we'll call a type error to be raised at runtime. Okay, so it doesn't like returns, that's fine. Okay, so called after the instance has been created by new, but before it is returned to the caller, the arguments uh, are those passed to the class constructor expression. If a base class has an init method, the derives class init method, if any, must explicitly call it to ensure proper initialization. Sorry, to ensure proper initialization of the base uh, class part of the instance. Um, because new and init work together in constructing 
objects, new to create it, and init, uh, init to customize it. No non-none value may be returned by init. Doing so will cause a type error to be raised at runtime. Okay, so definitely a none. And actually, there's one thing I want to do here um, with main. This is definitely overdoing it, um, but I think each time I make a change, um, and you know what, let's make it uh, during a batch of changes, but I should actually probably make sure that um, I don't have any, uh, So I'm curious here, so if it says, all right. I don't know if this is really any better than using the quick fix, but I'm also not sure typing it out each time is going to do anything other than introduce. This is interesting. I think this, well, this definitely goes, oh no, hang on. 77, we're still in, we're still good. Um, Again, I'm fighting for real estate here, so I got rid of the mini map, um, but I did want to keep the notes to self just so I can keep track of uh, these tabs. Oops. Okay, so that's... Both of these were pretty straightforward. I'm sort of expecting that we'll have batches of like either too easy or too hard. So we now move on to ARG002. So we've got six of those. Um, checks for the presence of unused arguments in instance method definitions. Now this kind of interests me because it's not like I've been making, um, it's not like I've been making the like the functions myself. So these are ones I would be quite reluctant to change, um, but it would be nice to still take a look and see what's going on so I can have a better idea uh, for myself in terms of what's going on instead. So what it does, checks for the presence of unused argument, uh, arguments in instant method definitions. Why is this bad? An argument that is defined but not used is likely a mistake and should be removed to avoid confusion. So we've got an example here, class uh, define foo self arg1 arg2 only prints arg1. So instead, we should do uh, def foo self arg1 print arg1. So let's see what's going on here. So yeah, I mean, this is kind of interesting to see an unused event. Now, one thing I'm a little curious here is if... Um, so ev quit, we are, I believe we're uh, implementing this for vent dispatch. There's gotta be a way that I can, yeah. So dispatch takes an event. Hmm. 
Hmm. So, yeah, it would seem to me like we're not, like, I think, uh, is this overloading? I don't think, no, I think it would be overloading if it had different, um, different arguments like so to me this is i guess the analogy would be implementing an interface right so ev quit has self and event um and in this case we don't have an event to be used um we don't use it inside ray's system exit and frankly i don't see any reason to um <clears throat> you know i don't see any reason to like artificially use the event in here. I am a little curious um, how I would handle a situation like this where I'm trying to implement, you know, trying to implement something else. So this is an example of the sort of thing that I would leave aside. I would, this is a, a good example of something I'd sort of like to make. Oh, actually, here's what I'm going to do. So we're going to um, spike these. And what I'm going to do is the ones that I can't fully remove from the program, I'm going to leave on a, in my notes to sell. I made it .sav because I'm an idiot, but uh, it just saves it from being committed to the, to the repository. So I can't see a situation here where I would want to use these. Yeah, um, so I'm I'm going to need to have a think about uh, arg two, but we're saying this is this is too uh, too tough. Okay, so it doesn't like us catching a blind exception. Uh, what it does checks for accept clauses that catch all exceptions. Uh, overly broad accept clauses can lead to unexpected behavior, such as catching keyboard interrupt or system exit exceptions that prevent the user from exiting the program. Instead of catching all exceptions, catch only those that are expected to be raised by the try block. So uh, try foo except base exception, try file not found error. Exceptions that are re-raised will not be flagged as they are expected to be caught elsewhere. Um, exceptions that are logged via logging.exception or logging.error with uh, xinfo enabled will not be flagged as this is a common pattern for propagating exception traces. So, <clears throat> um, I'm not going to work with this one. Um, there was a comment, um, I apologize, uh, there was a comment that, that actually specifically dealt with this that said, why this was okay but i don't have my youtube stuff up right now so i think in the name of time i'm going to leave that aside but i believe so uh, you know again this is the nice thing about this being part of an event and community members coming in and uh talking about me but i believe there is a um there is an answer to this as to why this is acceptable. Now, maybe I want to change that, right? It would be nice if I had a bit of an idea in terms of the types of exceptions I was expecting from the program. But um, for now, I will leave this aside. And maybe what I'll do is I'll start saying that, you know, these extras here are um, are going to be uh, extensions, right? Um, it'd be nice if I added new things to the roguelike, but maybe that's one way for me to handle it. Okay. So bugbear, which makes me think that this is not going to be critical. Uh, checks for unused variables in loops, for and while statements. Why is this bad? Defining a variable in a loop statement that is never used can confuse readers. If the variable is intended to be unused, e.g. to facilitate the uh, destructuring of a tuple or other object, prefix it with an underscore to indicate the intent. Otherwise, remove the variable entirely. So for ij and foo bar i, um, and then instead we can underscore. So I'm okay. Um, oh, that's annoying. Yeah, I mean, I could just do this too. Uh, 
on to COM 218, or 8, sorry, 812. All right, um, checks the absence of trailing commas. The presence of a trailing comma can reduce uh, diff size when parameters or elements are added or removed from function calls, function definitions, literal, etc. So this is almost certainly added by me. Um, I'm sure the tutorial actually had these. Okay, so line 37. Okay, let me clarify here. So we've got 3789. Really? Should have saved these two. I'm thinking a few of these might be, um, may not be in the the tutorial I don't know I mean the it does feel that the tutorial has a tendency to have a lot of the trailing commas and this just because it's unusual for me doesn't mean um, Like doesn't mean I shouldn't do it, so I'm going to follow the recommendation and see where it takes us. Although I think this time might be it might be a good one to um, well first of all save everything because I haven't been saving in between these. Okay. Oh no. I also think the fact that I'm saving is probably also doing some of the automatic formatting, so we might get some very exciting changes coming in. Okay, well, we don't need get ignore. Okay, so I'm going to just try running this now. Um, just making sure I didn't break anything. Okay, I did need to hit escape twice, so let's just see. All right, so I'm sure I was in like an inventory or something like that. All right, uh, so trailing comma is 
done. Looks like there's more to go though. So we're on to 819. Only two. So uh, checks for the presence of prohibited trailing commas. Trailing commas are not essential in some cases and therefore can be viewed as unnecessary. So, all right. Now these I think are ones that were actually uh, brought in by the tutorial. Um, but again, I'm trying to... Oop. Which one are we talking about here? Oh, <laughs> fair enough. Yeah, so that's a straightforward one to, to take out. Okay, so we're out of comma land. On to D100. Ah, undocumented modules, 19 of them. Um, okay, so first of all, shame on me. Open this window first. Okay. <clears throat> Oh, module. Um, yes. Okay. Well, let's read this out. I think I'm actually going to skip over this one for now. Um, I actually think this would be a good exercise to, to do because that sort of involves me explaining specifically what these things are doing. But I also think that this would be... Um, I don't know, like I said, this strikes me as something that maybe I want to actually sit down and maybe be a little thoughtful about. So, um, so yeah, let's just, but we'll still go through it. So uh, derive from the PyDoc style linter, checks for undocumented public module definitions. Public modules should be documented via doc strings to outline their purpose and contents. Generally, module doc strings should describe the purpose of the module and list the classes, exceptions, functions, and other objects that are exported by the module alongside a one-line summary of each. If the module is a script, the doc string should be usable as its usage message. If the code base adheres to a standard format module for doc strings, follow that for consistency. So here, class faster than light, uh, error zero division uh, error, def calculate speed, distance float time, Utility functions and classes for calculating speed. This module provides faster than light error, exceptional uh, exception when FTL speed is calculated and calculate speed, calculate speed given the distance at any uh, time. So yeah, and it, this is definitely going to be something that takes quite a bit of work. <clears throat> so uh, I'm willing to do that work, but that's going to be one that I save for my own time. Okay. Public classes should be documented via doc strings to outline their purpose and behavior. Generally, a class doc string should describe the class's purpose and list its public attributes and methods. So player, player in a game, attributes, name, string, points, integer, methods, so on and so forth. So um, 30 examples of these. Um, and I think I actually think this is a good exercise for me to go through again. Um, I might even do it in reverse order. So do the um, the lower, the lesser, sorry, the higher numbers uh, before the lower. But I don't think this is something I want to tackle today, or at least in the video. Ooh, uh, all right. Checks for undocumented public methods. I'm actually curious about this one. Okay. Yeah, I mean, obviously there are doc strings for a lot of, but not all of them, and there should be. Um, but again, same same argument. So again, I think the idea of going from the lower number to, or sorry, the um, kind of doing the list in reverse would be a good idea here. Okay, D103, public function. Um, so main, place entities, Get names at location, render bar. Okay, these ones I don't think would be too difficult, but public functions should be documented via doc strings to outline the purpose and behavior. Generally, a function doc string should describe the function's behavior, argument, side effects, exceptions, return values, and any other information that may be relevant to the user. If the code base adheres to a standard format uh, for function doc strings, follow that format for consistency. 
104. Undocumented pa uh, public package definitions. Right. Public packages should be documented via doc strings to outline their purpose and contents. Generally, package doc strings should list the modules and sub packages that are exported by the package if the code base adheres to a standard format for all package doc strings. Uh, follow that format for consistency. This would probably be good to do um, maybe at the end of the tutorial. Um, given that this is, uh, this may have things added to it as we, um, as we do things like inventories. I realize I'm skipping over pretty much all the doc style ones, but I, I feel that this is something, I feel like this is something good and I'm going to put some time into, um, but I don't necessarily think it's going to be something that I, I don't think it's going to be something that I, I, I'll benefit from in the purpose of a video uh, for the purposes of a video. I think this is something that maybe I want to just um, take some time and sort out for myself. Okay, checks for public init me uh, method definitions that are missing doc strings. Public init methods are used to initialize objects. Init methods should be documented via doc string to describe the methods, behavior, arguments, uh, side effects, exceptions, and any other information that may be relevant to the user. If the code base adheres to a standard format for init method doc strings, follow that format for consistency. So class city, init self name, population, uh, assigns name and population. I mean, I actually feel a few of th these are a few that we can probably follow that convention for. So um, This isn't really a one-liner. I mean, now it sort of is, except for the fact that I've got the three quotes. Something for me to deal with later. Should probably be now we'll go by the name that it gives i'm just taking a look uh, at how this doc string is done so the only thing here right is that if i've got this formula of you know initialize with a arguments here there is sort of an argument to be said or parameters i guess these would be called there is sort of an argument to be said. It's like, well, what exactly is this doc string providing that looking at the, um, you're just simply looking up here would do? And I, I'll be honest with you, I actually don't have a good answer for that. So, um, but I'll, I'll fill it in. Um, we'll at least get it to stop complaining about uh, 107 and then we can consider later whether or not this is something that I want to continue to follow. Um, I also do like that it provides references. So it might be uh, might be good for me to sort of sit down. What I figure is before my rule for myself internally is going to be um, before I try to disable one of these things or ignore it, 
I want to sit down and actually look at the references and see uh, if I am convinced, basically. Otherwise, I should probably be following it. Um, Definitely a long one. Really? I'm going to just focus on the doc strings. We'll worry about the others later. OK. Um. Hmm. You know, this one I'm going to leave alone because I need to remember exactly what the path. I'm pretty sure the path. Oh, right. Actually, no, I don't need to. Maybe you should have taken a look at those previous ones to see. Yeah, I should have been. Honestly, I think I should have been a little more careful on this. I'll, what I'll maybe do is take a look at the um, before I commit this stuff. Uh, I'll just double check that I didn't get lazy and ignore um, <sighs> yeah I don't know I should probably double check that I didn't miss cases like this I also shouldn't be using the three quotes if it's not multi-line, but again, I'll deal with that when it complains about that later. Um, I said empty collection of items. Okay. Uh, 
Oh, no, this is interesting. So shouldn't this fall under complaining about... I feel like this should be a different... Oh, maybe not. Hang on. Yeah, I messed this one up. Again, it's going to yell at me for length, so I'll get a second chance at this one. Um, okay. So what I need to stop doing is looking at this and actually look at what... So I've kind of answered my own question, right? The doc string should be based on this, not this. This also feels wrong, but um,
Yeah. Doesn't feel good. <laughs> uh, okay, we've got nine more of these things. funny I got a lot more descriptive on some of the longer ones this one I don't know let's just keep running with it one of the things I can do too is take a look at how um, sort of another library does it. So I mean, one option I have is just to take a look at um, TCOD and see how they handle things like uh, in it and then um, try to adjust accordingly. Right now, this is just a matter of trying to um, sort of try and work through the, uh, the different messages. Okay. Um, So this is a tricky one, right? So do I, when I say I'm initializing, um, I think I'm going to skip the init right now, but when I say I'm initializing something, do I actually include the behavior of the, uh, the init? Because that feels, well, I could go both ways on it, to be honest, so...
not sure if this is all that clear to an outsider, but like I said, I'm getting these done and then we will refine. Okay. Uh, So technically 107 is done and we can delete that from the list although we may return uh, we may return to it for um, actually you know what So that did take a while, so I'm definitely going to... Okay, no, we've got this. One line doc string should fit on a line. Okay, checks for single line doc strings that are broken across multiple lines. PEP57 uh, recommends that doc strings can fit, uh, that can fit on one line should be reformatted on a single line for consistency and readability. So three, one, three, so in this case, Don't you like? Okay, fair enough. Yeah, this is going to yell at me for being too long now, but all right. Save that for a separate complaint. 205 um, checks for doc string summary lines that are not separated from the doc uh, string description by one line. PEP uh, 257 recommends that multi line doc strings consist of a summary line, uh, just like a one line doc string, followed by a blank line, followed by a more elaborate description. Aha! Okay. Seven of these. Really, that's in the class. Okay, that was pretty straightforward. Uh, 
Multi-line summary first line. Uh, checks for doc string summary lines that are not positioned on the first physical line of the doc string. PEP257 recommends that multi-line doc strings consist of a summary line, just like a one-line doc string followed by a blank line, followed by a more elaborate description. The summary line should be located on the first physical line of the doc string immediately after the opening quotes. This rule may not apply to all projects. Its applicability is a matter of convention. By default, this rule is enabled when using the Google convention, is disabled when using the NumPy and PEP257 conventions. Oh, so we seem to have potentially two... Eh. Okay, so recommends that multi-line doc strings consist of a summary line, just like a one-line doc string, followed by a blank line, followed by a more elaborate description. The summary line should be located on the second physical line of the doc string immediately after the opening quotes and the blank line. Okay. Um, I actually would prefer to follow the PEP. 257. Um. Well, you know what? Okay, let's say when in Rome, it's going to be if I'm consistent it'll be easier to um to convert in future I'll just double check. Yeah, no D13. Okay, ends in period. Checks for doc strings where in which the first line does not end in a period. PEP257 recommends that the first line of a doc string is written in the form of a command entering in a period. This rule may not apply to all projects. Its applicability is a matter of convention. By default, this rule is enabled when using NumPy and PEP257 conventions and disabled when using the Google convention. It's very detailed if it's uh, commenting on my punctuation. I usually drop periods just to get a little extra space in tweets, but... Okay, 401. Uh, checks for doc string lines that are not in an imperative mood. <laughs> Wow, okay. Uh, PEP257 recommends that the first line of a doc string be written in the imperative mood for consistency. Hint to rewrite the doc string in the imperative, phrase the first line as if it were a command. This rule may not apply to all projects. Um, its applicability is a matter of convention. By default, this rule is enabled when using NumPy and PEP257 conventions and disabled when using Google. So the example of what not to do returns the mean value of given values and use instead return the mean of the given values. Fascinating. Um, I actually like 14 examples of these. I... believe this is the imperative. <laughs> <laughs> I 
like, <laughs> I mean, okay, sure. Um, no, this is stupid. Um, Populate. <laughs> Wonder if it says initializes. Yeah. Sorry, one second here. Sure, prepare. <laughs> All right, I'll work. <laughs> that uh, that works. Uh, it's out. I'm definitely going to need to adjust some of these doc strings after the fact. So I, there is a question as to whether or not this is a good use of my time, but that was also slightly amusing. Okay, checks for doc strings that start with this. Pep257 recommends that the first line of a doc string be written in the imperative mood for consistency. Um, I'm still slightly annoyed about the initialized one, but uh, apparently 415 is no longer an issue. So ends in punctuation, checks for doc strings in which the first line does not end in a punctuation mark, such as a period, question mark, or exclamation. <laughs> okay, so exclamation marks points would have worked. Uh, the first line of a doc string should end with a uh, period question mark or exclamation point for grammatical correctness and consistency. This rule may not apply to all projects. The applicability is a matter of convention. By default, this rule is enabled when using the Google convention and disabled when using NumPy and PEP257. Okay, on to E501. Too long. 63 instances of a line that's too long. Um, some by 10, some by considerably more. Checks for lines that exceed the maximum uh, specified maximum character length. Overlong lines can hurt readability. PEP 8, for example, recommends limiting lines to 79 characters. By default, this rule enforces a limit of 88 characters for compatibility with black, though that limiter is configurable by the line length setting. 
In the interest of pragmatism, this rule makes a few exceptions when determining whether a line is over long. Namely, it 1. ignores lines that consist of a single word without any white space between its characters, ignores lines that end with a URL as long as the URL starts before the line length threshold, ignores the line that ends with a pragma comment, e.g. Uh, hash type ignore or no QA, as long as the pragma comment starts before the line length threshold, that is, a line will not be flagged as over long if a pragma comment causes it to exceed the line length. This behavior aligns with that of the rough formatter, ignores SPDX license identifiers and copyright notices, e.g. SPDX license identifier MIT, which are machine readable and should not wrap over multiple lines. If lint pydoc style ignore overlong task comments is true, this rule will also ignore comments that start with any of the specified lint task tags, e.g. to do. For example, my function param 1 through 10, use instead uh, 1 through 10. Hint when suppressing E501 errors within multi-line strings like doc strings, the no QA directive should come at the end of the string, like after closing a triple quote, uh, and we'll apply the entire string like so. So let's see if we can, ah, uh, let's see if we can tidy this up. Oh, this is an easy one. Okay, so it's not going to let me, it's not going to have an automatic fix, sadly. Um, So I guess usually when these things have been too long, we just split them. Surely there is another example. I'm near certain I've seen an example of like a long one. I'm just trying to figure out if it always goes one. Like one parameter per line or if. You try and get as much in. Actually, you know what? Um, we're going to follow. Mm, that's not a definition, though. Okay, I'm minimizing the number of new lines, so... Why doesn't this complain about an imperative? <laughs> I'm actually not quite sure what this means. So invoke the item's ability. This action will be given to provide context. I realize I'm changing the meaning here, but I'm actually having a little trouble parsing that. So, um...
So following what I had said before, am I still? No, we're good. Um, although. Because it's changing. Uh, yeah, anyways. Ooh, this is a tricky one. Um, <laughs> yeah, quick fix is just disable it. I mean, is this really that much clearer? I always hate it when it's one. Yeah, this is these are the ones that just do my head in. Um, Only 53 more of these to go. This is tricky, actually, um, because the if I hit enter, um, hmm, I mean, there's a way I can like stitch together the string here, but this feels really, this, this is, I actually, this is one thing that drives me nuts about trying to maintain the, uh, the line lengths. You wind up doing silly things like, um, you know, looking for, like, obviously I don't want to rewrite the text. Um, the... Yeah, you know what? I'm skipping this one. I will learn. Oh boy. Um...
I wonder if this is going to complain if I just go for single quotes. <sighs> I hate you. Um, these are caught self contradictory. <laughs> um, I notice uh, it didn't didn't um, the restore it to the game map. I guess didn't quite fit the uh, um, the imperative. Oh boy. Again, I still feel a few of these could be doing better in terms of the... Um, I need to lose three characters. Almost. <laughs> Actually, you know what? is fine.
So I realize I'm not talking a whole lot here, but some of this is just, it's not even typing new stuff. It's really just trying to, I mean, okay. So one of the things that's difficult is that I don't really believe in a lot of these changes that I'm making. They feel sort of arbitrary to match the rule. And it's not even that I think like, so I think, you know, it's good to have a line limit and it's good to, um, you know, it's good to try and keep that consistency. But like I said, there were a couple here where it was just like, it's a bridge too far in terms of nonsense. Um, so I left them, but even some of these marginal ones, I'm like, okay, you know, I can create the, I can create the divisions, you know, I'll dance the dance, but it still feels a little weird. So now surely, Huh. So initialize is permitted in some, but not another. There's a, let me just see if I can, I think there's a project I worked on where I ran into one of these. Um, I guess this will uh, this will do. Right, so it's not going to like this because it's... Um Saved. Okay. Um.
think this is how it does it when it's split over more than one line. It would be wonderful if there was some kind of um, some kind of auto fix for the length because this is definitely taking some time. Whoopsies! There we go. That wasn't it. All right, what don't you like? Trim the surrounding white space, fine. Okay, there we go. Yep. <laughs> I'm assuming there's a lot that you don't like. First line is doc stream, of course. few more of these. I should just save to get rid of the trailing white space uh, messages. All right, I need to find two characters.
Okay. Um, I think the rest of this should be pretty straightforward. Sorry, just one second here. I was trying to think of a way to handle the extra, the two long lines here, but I think I'm just going to settle for, is this the right way to do this? That just looks weird. Well, I mean, it's consistent as much as I hate it. Last one. Um, okay, it's not pretty. Oh, never mind. Didn't like that. So how the hell did those other ones get away with it? Okay, I'm going to try something. Okay, so um, yep, yeah, this was fine. That's an expected error. This looks so bizarre. All right, well, we cleared him out. Um, raw string and exception checks for the use of string literals and exception constructors. Python includes the raise uh, in the default traceback and formatters like rich and ipython uh, do too. By using a string literal, the error message will be duplicated in the traceback, which can make the traceback less readable. 
Uh, so an example, raise runtime error, some value is incorrect. This will produce traceback most recent call last file temp.py in line two. Raise runtime hour, some value is incorrect. Runtime error, some value is incorrect. So instead we assign this string to a variable, some value is incorrect. I don't actually see why this is all that bad, but What's its justification for this? Oh, interesting. It actually doesn't give a justification. I mean, this that that in particular is um, is unfortunate just because um, like this is being used to um, to give message to the player we don't actually expect this to show up in the traceback but Seems a little more sensible. I mean, I suppose there's a um, one justification for some variation of this would be, I know, you know, when we plan on selling this internationally, um, these messages would be put into a file of messages and so that it's easier to sort of, sort of switch them out um, in terms of dialogue. So I suppose... Um, it doesn't hurt to have these in variables anyway. Just this current solution is a little, feels a little excessive. Still, I'm not confident enough to start messing around with what it does and doesn't tell me. Um, and if I'm not gonna do that, then, um, like I said, the goal here was to get rid of these problems. Okay. 101 is off the list. Also, I think I got rid of 501 too. On to 102. There's only one of those. Um, 
exception must not use an f string literal assigned to a variable first. And what's interesting here is that we don't need the f string. Uh, so what does it do? Checks for the use of f strings and exception constructors. Uh, constructors. Why is this bad? Python uses the raise uh, in the default traceback, and formatters like Rich and I Python do too. By using an f string, the error message will be duplicated in the traceback, which can make the traceback less readable. Of course, the drawback here is that we just introduce another uh, complaint. So. Okay, shebang not uh, executable, derived from the flake8 executable linter, uh, checks for a shebang directive in a file that is not uh, executable. And Python, a shebang, also known as a hashbang, is the first line of a script which specifies the interpreter that uh, should be used to run the script. The presence of a shebang suggests that a file is intended to be executable. If a file contains a shebang but is not executable, then the shebang is misleading or the file is missing the execu executable bit. If the file is meant to be executable, executable at a shebang, as in, um, sorry, we should actually bring this in. Hang on. Okay, user bin and Python. Otherwise, remove the executable bit from the file. If a file is considered uh, a file is considered executable if it has an executable bit set, I, its permissions uh, mode in, uh, intersects with uh, 0111 as such. This rule is only available on Unix systems and is not enforced on Windows. Um, or WSL. Okay, so it would seem to me um, it seems to me like this is something solved in the terminal. Um I know this is a ch ch mod. It, actually, it might be the same as. Okay. Um... Where's the X? Yeah, it's plus, okay. Okay, so this should be executable now. Cool. Unused import, that's an unexpected one. Uh, 
entity.entity .entity is imported but not used. Um, unused imports add a performance overhead at runtime and a risk of creating import cycles. They also increase the cognitive load of reading the code. If an import statement is used to check for the availability or existence of a module, consider using import lib util find spec instead. If an import statement is used to re-export symbols as part of a module's public interface, consider using a redundant import alias, which instructs Rough and other tools to respect the re-export and avoid marketing as un unused. As in from module import member as member, alternatively, you can use the all to declare a symbol as part of the module's interface, as in import some module all equals some module. Um, fix safety. Fixes to removed unused imports are safe except in init.py files. Applying fixes to init.py files is currently in preview. The fix offered depends on the type of unused import. Ruff will suggest, actually, hang on, let's see what the suggestion is. I'm sure I. this is something that the tutorial already covered and I forgot. Okay, fstring missing placeholders. Um, checks for fstrings that do not contain any placeholder expressions. fstrings are a convenient way to format strings, but they are not necessary. If there are no placeholder expressions, uh, expressions to format, in this case, a regular string should be used instead, as an fstring without placeholders can be confusing for readers who may expect such a placeholder to be present. An F string without any placeholders could also indicate that the author forgot to add the placeholder expression. So we had one of those. I'm interested in seeing. Right. OK, so <laughs> already dealt with it. A 100. Um... Checks for missing from future import annotation imports upon detecting type annotations that can be written more succinctly under PEP 563. Uh, PEP 585 enabled the use of a number of convenient type annotations such as list instead of capital list. Uh, however, these annotations are only available on 3.9 or higher unless the from future import annotations import is present. Similarly, PIC, uh, PEP 604 enabled the use of the, uh, I'll just say, OR operator for union, such as string or none, instead of optional string. However, these annotations are only available in Python 3.10 or higher, unless the from future import annotations import is present. By adding the future import, the Py upgrade rules can automatically migrate existing code to use the new syntax, even for older Python versions. This rule uh, thus pairs well with Py upgrade with Ruff's Py upgrade rules. This rule respects the target versioning setting. For example, if your project targets th Python 3.10 and above, adding from future import annotations does not impact your ability to le leverage PEP 604 style unions, e.g. to convert to optional STR or uh, to uh, STR or none. As such, this rule will only flag such uses usages if your project targets 3.9 or below. Example, uh, from typing import list dict optional and the function definition, Use instead from uh, future import annotations, import uh, listic and optional. Okay. And then after under this part, I'm a little less clear on, but let's just see what this gives. Nine. Cool. 
Let's deal with some of these too. I'm sure there'll be more, but Uh, Boolean type hint positional argument. Checks for the use of Boolean positional arguments and function definitions as determined by the presence of a bool type hint. Calling a function with the Boolean positional argument is confusing as it means the meaning of the Boolean value is not clear to the caller and to future readers of the code. The use of a Boolean will also limit the function to only two possible behaviors, which makes the function difficult to extend in the future. Instead, consider refactoring into separate implementations for the true and false cases using an enum or making the argument a keyword only argument to force callers to be explicit when providing the argument. Uh, in preview, this rule will also flag annotations that include Boolean variants such as bool or int. So round number, uh, float, number float up bool, return ceiling number if up else floor number. Um, yeah, and they say, I'm confused by what true and false means. Instead, reflect factor into separate implementations, round up and round down, or refactor to use an enum. Uh, rounding method enum. Mm, I don't know about that. Like, why is... Well, okay, yeah, sorry. I guess I, I see why the enum makes more sense, or uh, is a little clearer, but... Uh, okay, I don't think I'm going to touch this, but I am curious to see how prevalent it is. Only one. Um, but this is a keyword argument, isn't it? That showed him. <laughs> okay, that cleared one and two. Hang on, I think I might have screwed myself doing that. Uh, I'm just going to try and get to the end of the level here. Okay. Um, so I didn't run into any problems. Let's take a look in the... Oop. Yeah, so I don't see any error messages either. So um, I was worried that because I it was no longer a keyword, um, there might have been something that was calling it that didn't um, didn't work. But that doesn't seem to be the case. So I'm not going to question it. Uh, I'm also going to...
I forgot to save a bunch of my uh, steps here, so I'm just going to hit save on everything and move on to the next part. Okay. Uh, Boolean default value positional argument two checks for the use of Boolean positional arguments and function definitions is determined by the presence of a Boolean default. Uh, calling ah okay no this makes sense so this will, the last one was type hence I think this one is defaults both have been covered so we are now on to I. 001. Import block is unsorted or unformatted. Fix is sometimes available, deduplicates groups, and sorts imports provided on the provided iSort settings. Consistency is good. Use a common convention for imports to make your code more readable and idiomatic. Import pandas, uh, import numpy. Okay, I'm not... I really wish it would actually give some justification for why this ordering is better than the other one, but let's see what the quick fix gives us. I'll take it. Yeah, so it looks like it's just type checking that's affected by these. I'm just worrying about I001. Anything else is uh, secondary. Right, because these are, yes, from my own stuff. Okay, that was easy. N818. Exception name impossible should be named with an error suffix. I mean, it should, well, it's not really an error though. All right, uh, derived from the PEP8 naming linter, checks for custom exception definitions that omit the error suffix. The error suffix is recommended by PEP8 because exceptions should be classes. The class naming convention applies here. However, you should use the suffix error on your exception names if the exception actually is an error. Yeah, so it isn't. Um, but... Can I search the whole project? Yeah. I don't feel like great about that, but um Actually, hang on. Good. Uh, this will be... I feel like I'm breaking the seal on something here, but uh, I'm actually going to ignore this one.
because the the logic behind disabling that one is says if it is in fact an error and it's not so i'm not uh, okay pgh 003 use specific rule codes when ignoring type issues Um, check for the type ignore annotations that suppress all type warnings as opposed to specifically target type warnings. Why is this bad? Suppressing all warnings can hide issues in the code. Blanket type ignore annotations are also more difficult to interpret and maintain as the annotation does not clarify which warnings are intended to be suppressed. Um, yeah, we don't have a... Crap. So I'm going to leave this one for now. And I think what I will do, I'm, this might be one that I just sort of run into the buzzsaw and, uh, and see specifically what, what's being ignored here. Okay. Too many arguments. <laughs> the royal ear can only handle so many. Um, So checks for function definitions that include too many arguments. By default, this rule allows up to five arguments as configured by lint pilot max args option. Functions with many arguments are harder to understand, maintain, and call. Consider refactoring functions with many arguments into smaller functions with fewer arguments or using objects to group related arguments. Um, so it doesn't like uh, entities, actors, items, render messages, and generate dungeon i so do not like this rule like <sighs> there's a couple of ways that we can sort of fix so let, let's take um let's take entity right so maybe x and y coordinates should be like a tuple um so that would bring us, that would take one. So now we're seven of five. Um, you know, maybe character, color, and name would be representations. So that would knock off another two. So, I mean, I guess that would get us, that would get us to five there. Um, yeah, I really do not like this rule. Okay, so these ones I don't entirely disagree with. Um, there's eight of them. So this is one that I... Um, so magic value used in comparison, consider placing three. So let's get rid of this one. So uh, magic value comparison checks for the use of unnamed numerical constants, magic values in comparisons. The use of magic values can make code harder to read and maintain as readers will have to infer the meaning of the value from the context. Such values are discouraged by PEP8. For convenience, this rule excludes a variety of common values from magic value definitions such as zero, one, and the empty string and main. So uh, apply discount if price is less than 100 return price divided by two instead define max discount at the top and then put it in there so i i actually don't disagree with this thing and i i can't, this is not exactly um well okay there's a, cu a couple examples that i took uh, from this so when i was doing an assignment in school they they had they made us work in pairs and i actually think that's a really good thing to do in um in some classes particularly in some faculties because there's definitely a type of like there are some subjects that really just lend themselves to um you know i'm i'm a solo rock star and i don't need nobody and while I think universities are more than just vocational training, I think, 
you know, especially if someone has really been able to go through like high school or, you know, well, all grade school, really. Um, and like not learn how to work with people like higher education is really that last chance that you get to learn those vital skills. Um, so forcing group work like it, um, it's, it sucks so bad because you just works with some people who you are utterly astonished. Like you devalue the school you are in because these airheads are are in your group like it is it is incredibly frustrating to have to work with that but man does that get you ready for the real world <laughs> um you know uh there is you know there's all types that you got to work with um so but I, I remember now. And again, like if this series has demonstrated anything, it's like I, I have absolutely no business critiquing other people's code. But um, when I went through their part, I remember going through a class and I think it had variables like X1 through X5, X, sorry, X1 through X5 defined. And I believe X2 and X4 were never used. Um, but then on top of that, you know, it, including that fun little search. What was uh, what made that even harder was that they were done with comparisons like this. So imagine it was well, I guess X would actually mean something because we've got a coordinate system. So let's let's just say I and J, right? So if I less than or equal to three, and it's like, what the hell am I even looking for here? Um, so. I'm not going to change this here. Like, again, I, I kind of agree with this. And I think what I will probably do is uh, define these constants elsewhere and uh, and import them. But for now, I'm going to I'm going to say I'm skipping this. Um. Oh, okay. This might be a little tricky for me to handle. Uh, derived from Flake 8, use pathlib linter. Uh, checks for uses of OS remove. Pathlib offers a high level API for path manipulation as compared to the lower level API offered by OS. When possible, using path object methods such as path and link can improve readability over the OS module's counterparts. Uh, note that OS functions may be preferable if performance is a concern, e.g. in hot loops. Um, I'll try it. Okay, checks for the use of OS path exists. Pathlib offers a high level API for path manipulation as compared to the lower level API offered by OS. When possible, using path object methods such as path exists can improve readability over the OS module's counterparts, uh, e.g. OS path exists note OS functions may be preferable if performance is a concern. So instead of path exists file.py. Um, oh, interesting. No, hang on. This this one actually seems to make a little more sense. Spoke too soon. Uh, 
Okay, on to one, two, three. Open should be path open. Of course it is. Uh, I think we need to import, yeah. So it checks for the open built-in, pathlib offers the high-level API, when possible path object um, can improve readability over the open. Again, I'm I'm questioning this. Um, I'm questioning this readability thing. Um, but I'm um, I'm running with it. Good God. Okay, path one, two, three is dealt with. On to RSE 102. 11, unnecessary parentheses on raised exception. Uh, fix is always available. Checks for unnecessary parentheses on raised exception. If an exception is raised without any arguments, parentheses are not required as the raised statement accepts either an exception instance or an exception class, which is then uh, implicitly instantiated. Removing the parentheses makes the code more concise. Parentheses can be omitted if the exception is a class as opposed to a function call. This rule isn't always capable of distinguishing between the two. For example, if you import the, the a function module get exception from another module, module get exception returns an exception object, this rule will incorrectly mark the parentheses in raise module get exception as unnecessary. Example, raise type error, okay. So not implemented error. Um, let's okay. Yeah, want to make sure that wasn't something we defined. So ret503. Uh, checks for missing explicit return statements at the end of functions that can return non-none values. Why is this bad? The lack of an explicit return statement at the end of a function that can return a non-none value can cause confusion. Python implicitly returns none if no other return value is present. Add an explicit return none can make code more readable by clarifying intent. Um, weren't we talking about conciseness? Ah, yes, this notorious one. Uh, okay. I'm just saying, I'm, I'm just saying this vindicates my, my concern is all. Uh, all right. 505. Checks for else statements with a return statement in the preceding if block. Why is this bad? The else statement, excuse me, is not needed as the return statement will always break out of the enclosing function. Removing the else will reduce nesting and make the code more readable. Never really thought of that. Okay, I kind of see it. I'm not... 
I'm not super sold on this argument, but again, I'm I'm working with. <laughs> oh boy! All right. Um... Yeah, I'm not super sold on this argument. Um... But like I said, I'm not um, I'm not yet like I, I'm I've not yet hardened in my beliefs on these things, so I'm gonna follow what the computer tells me to. Uh, okay. Superfluous else rays checks for else statements with a raise statement in the preceding if block. The else statement is not needed as the raise statement will always break out of the current scope. Removing the else will reduce nesting and make the code more readable. I mean, yeah, so like the whole argument here about like removing nesting with the else if. It's like it's already an if, right? What what nesting am I preventing by this? All right, doesn't like asserts. Checks for the use of the assert keyword. Assertions are removed when Python is run with optimization requested, i.e. when the O flag is present, which is a common practice in production environments. As such, assertions should not be used for runtime validation of user import, uh, input or to enforce interface constraints. Consider raising a meaningful error instead of using assert. So assert x greater than zero expected a positive value, um, if not x. Okay, um, I'm not... I don't hate this. Uh, I actually think this makes some sense. Um, I'm not 100% sure what error I want to throw. Um, so I'm going to leave this for lack of clarity in terms of how I'm going to fix this, but I actually think this makes some sense. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> All right. So I did mention this in the, um, in the last episode. So suspicious pickle usage, uh, ch checks for calls to pickle functions or modules that wrap them. Deserializing untrusted data with pickle and other deserialization modules is insecure as it can allow for the creation of arbitrary objects, which can then be used to achieve arbitrary code execution and un otherwise unexpected behavior. Avoid deserializing untrusted data with pickle and other deserialization modules. Instead, consider safer formats such as JSON. If you must des deserialize untrusted data with Pickle, consider signing the data with a secret key and verifying the signature before deserializing the payload. This will prevent an attacker from injecting arbitrary objects into serialized data. Uh, I think this is something... So I, I basically what I want to do here, I actually want to sort of sit down and read how I would fix this because uh, I, I think this is something I should this is something I should understand um, but now is not the time for me to do that <laughs> oh man they really don't like games okay um, suspicious non-cryptographic random usage so 311 Checks uses for uses of cryptographically weak pseudo-random number generators. Cryptographically weak pseudo-random number generators are insecure as they are easily predictable. They can allow an attacker to guess the generated numbers and compromise the security of the system. 
Instead, use a cryptographically secure pseudo random number generator, such as using the secrets module when generating random numbers for security purposes. Um, yeah, so I mean, clearly the 14 instances of us, you know, taking <laughs> random. <laughs> Oh, this is very funny. It's like, my God, the Russians are finding out whether the, the troll that I confused is moving northwest or southwest. They can predict it. They can control the troll. What are we going to do? Um, yeah, this is silly. Um, I'm not going to suppress this because there's a lot of them. And we'll see if there's maybe a um, another way for me to... To think about that but i am i am not worrying about this right now uh -huh. collapsible if derived from the flake 8 simplify linters fix is sometimes available checks for nested if statements that can be collapsed into a single if statement why is this bad? Nesting if statements leads to deeper indentation, makes coder harder to read. Instead, combine the conditions into a single if statement uh, with an and operator. Uh, okay, actually, I don't hate this. So if it's a game map, and if it has the attribute parent, and if parent is a game map... Oh, but it doesn't... Um, Okay. I thought it was okay with these kinds of comments. Okay, so um, we are moving this back. Putting this in here, getting rid of that. There we go. Oh dear. Okay, so if it's inbounds and the event button is one, yeah, that is completely fine. So the previous one, um, one of the things that allowed me to do that was, um, I believe it checks. So like, if this is true, I should have uh, looked at the previous one, but basically it ch I believe it checks it in order. So if it doesn't have that, if it fails on that has attribute or whatever, uh, it should never get to the part where it'll throw the error. Um, so I don't actually mind that particular one. Okay, we're on to sim 105. I feel like I've left a lot in. Let me just... Right, so the assert I wanted to work on later. 301 I wanted to learn for myself. 311 we don't care about. So, yep, sim 105. Apparently, oh, no space. Okay, um, checks for try except pass blocks that can be replaced with the context lib suppress context ma uh, manager. 
Using context lib suppress is more concise and directly communicates the intent of the code to suppress a given exception. Note that context lib suppress is slower than using try except pass directly for performance critical uh, code. Consider retaining the try except pass pattern. Um, I think this is an appropriate use of it. So if it's an AI, um, whoops. Okay. Uh, if else block instead of if. Checks for if else blocks that can be replaced with a ternary operator. Why is this bad? If else blocks that assign a value to a variable in both branches can be expressed more concisely by using a ternary operator. So if foo bar equals x, else bar equals y, use instead bar x if foo else y. Okay. <laughs> ah, our magic numbers. How much you want to bet this is going to yell at me for being too long? Okay, never mind. T two O one on to new bugs. Okay, one. <laughs> Print! <laughs> How dare you! Um, I do wonder why this isn't going to the message log, though. So I don't think I'm going to change this right now because this, I think this will involve a little bit of work, but uh, fixes sometimes available. Print statements are useful in some situations, e.g. debugging, but would typically be omitted from production code. Print statements can lead to an accidental inclusion of sens sensitive information in logs and are not configurable by clients, unlike logging statements. Def add numbers, print the sum of A and B is A plus B, return A and B. Instead, def add numbers uh, A, B. So yeah, I'm not gonna focus on that right now. Um, TCH002. Typing only third party import. Checks for third party imports that are only used for type annotations but aren't defined in a type checking block. Why is this bad? Unused imports add a performance overhead at runtime and risk creating import cycles. If an import is only used in typing only context, it can instead be imported conditionally under an if type checking block to minimize runtime overhead. 
If lint flake 8 type checking quote annotations is set to true, annotations will be wrapped in quotes, if doing so would enable co the corresponding import to be moved into an if type checking block. If a class requires that type annotations be available at runtime, such as uh, the case as Pydantix, SQL Alchemy, and other libraries, consider using the lint flake 8 type checking runtime evaluated base classes and lint flake 8 flake, uh, sorry, flake 8 type checking runtime evaluated decorator settings to mark them as such. So future annotations import pandas as PD function, uh, DF data frame int, use instead future annotations import type checking, pandas PD. Okay. Um, can we just do this? Cool. Try 003 from the Triceratops linter. Uh, apparently, we don't have these anymore. Text for long exception messages that are not defined in the exception, exception class itself. By formatting an exception message at the raise site, the exception class becomes less reusable and may now raise inconsistent messages depending on when it is raised. If the exception message is instead defined within the exception class, it will be consistent across all raise invocations. This rule is not enforced for some built-in exceptions that are commonly raised with a message and would be unusual to subclass such as not implemented error. So yes, I see why that is not a thing anymore. Technically two more, although I'm a little disturbed by the fact that there are 214 problems waiting for us. So up 006. 23 of them. All right. Ah, okay. So derive, uh, derive from the Pi upgrade linter, uh, checks for the use of generics that can be replaced with standard library variants based on PEP 585. PEP uh, 585 has enabled collections in the Python standard library like list to be used as generics directly instead of importing analogous members from the typing module like typing.list. When available, the PEP 585 syntax should be used instead of importing members from the typing module as it's more concise and readable. Importing those members from typing is considered deprecated as of PEP 585. This rule is enabled when targeting Python 3.9 or later. By default, it, by default, it's also enabled for earlier Python versions if from future import annotations is present as future annotations are not evaluated at runtime. If your code relies on runtime type annotations, either directly or via li a library like Pydantic, you can disable this behavior for Python versions prior to 3.9 by setting lint pi upgrade keep runtime typing to true. Cool. This should be pretty straightforward. I'm a little more relaxed about um, automatically changing these because this is just, this is capitalization. Like this is not, uh... this is not gonna be something I put a lot of thought into. Ooh, that was very scary for a second there. All right, presumably seven is gonna be the um, or. I'm just anticipating getting rid of that one. 
All right, our last one. Uh, non PEP 604 annotation from the Pi upgrade linter. Check for type annotations that can be rewritten based, based on the PEP 604 syntax. Why is this bad? PEP 604 introduced a new syntax for union type annotations based on the OR operator. This syntax is more concise and readable than previous typing union and typing optional syntaxes. This rule is enabled when targeting Python 3.10 or later. By default, is also enabled for earlier Python versions if from future import annotations is present as future annotations are not evaluated at runtime. If your code relies on runtime type annotations, either directly or via a library like Pydantic, you can disable this behavior for Python versions prior to 3.10 by setting lint py upgrade keep runtime typing to true. So instead of from typing import union, use the or. And again, I think this will be a case where I let the, in fact, I think we can close notes to self. I think we're going to let the quick fix handle it. I'll actually knock down a lot of errors for us. So there was a O'Reilly book that I was reading to try and I mean again this um this particular um event, right, the roguelike dev event, um has sort of been my excuse to try and learn a little more Python outside of the the little um little area I've carved out for myself. Um but um, yeah, there's going to be a few of these. So you know what? It's probably going to be better if I do it by the the file. Yeah. So missing doc strings I can live with. Um, but yeah, so uh, what was I going to say? Um, but yeah, there was an O'Reilly book that I was reading um, that sort of made its case for um, sort of uh, what am I trying to say? It made its its case for why. Um, like type hinting and stuff like that um, makes sense. And I, w I was kind of largely sold on it. Um, it's funny because like one thing that I, I did rather like about Python was um, not having to, like not having to worry. Like I kind of liked duck typing and, and stuff like that. Like it's just, it's more natural for me not to think along those lines and maybe just try and build in such a way that it it just doesn't come up as much but i've been persuaded sort of over time that this is not a, like i think the the most persuasive thing for me is that being able to like you know vs code or well i mean it just about anything but like vs code is kind of what i've moved into um, I used to use Jupyter Lab a whole lot, but um, I, d I had like an absolutely massive notebook and I actually found that like using it in a browser was quite unpleasant. It would take a very long time for things to run. And for one reason or another, the same uh, notebook uh, would run quite quickly inside of um, inside of VS Code. So that's kind of what sold me. But in the end, the whole the big the most compelling argument for me was just um, you know, this is a really great tool and it's a free tool. So why wouldn't you want to help it help you, <laughs> basically? Um, so I've I've been I've been slowly persuaded, but of course now I have all the work of like figuring out um, what I need to what I need to do to to make this work. Um, So that's what um, doing all this fun has been about. So yeah, it looks like a lot of these errors are 
Um, or the missing doc strings and such, which I do I do want to deal with. Um, just not, maybe not today. I am happy to kind of get all the fluff out though. Um, like if we can just reduce this to a handful of errors, I'm gonna be happy. Okay. Hmm. I don't think this is a tuple, though. It is still utterly bizarre to me that some of these count as Yeah, I really need to figure out why some get flagged and others don't. Okay. It's fine. Game map. A lot of these, but oh, yeah, these are the ones that were too long. So, um, thirty-two in input handlers. So, um, the thing I'm most worried about is that I'm just going to miss some of these. So, lots of missing doc strings. Doesn't like the magic numbers. All right, that's a start. Message log. I guess we can just get rid of all of this, can we? Oh, for heaven's sake. Uh, okay, missing doc strings I can live with. Proc gen. Okay, get rid of you. Now we need. 
need to reorganize you again. Uh, trailing white space. Shouldn't saving this fix this now? All right, this is another one that gets a lot of complaints, but I don't see... Ooh, that's exciting. Missing a return statement. But it's not. Okay, I'm going to close that for now uh, and deal with the deal with the manageable stuff. Um, render functions are missing doc strings. Render order, missing doc strings. Setup game doesn't need optional anymore. I think I might have found the problem. Uh, doesn't like assert, doesn't like pickle, doesn't like the blind exception, but what's my fix for that? Nothing. Okay, missing dot, okay. Um, Everything got changed, I think. Base component was not changed. So first of all, does this run? I'm going to do a full run of the game. Aha! Uh, less than or equal is not supported between instances of actor and int. And interestingly enough, that crashed me out of the game as opposed to reporting that to the log. Oh, well, that makes sense. Uh, Does that make sense? Okay, so my easy answer here, let's go take a look at what the project looked like in this section. So input handlers, Yeah.
pretty straightforward little dungeon. Yeah, so everything seems to be okay. I guess the one thing I didn't do was use the confusion spell, but we can at least blow myself up. Um, try and bump into as many things as possible. Hit escape. All right. Um, looks like we have appeased the machine gods. Uh, I'm going to do one last batch here where I open everything up just to make sure that the I have an idea of all the complaints. Actually, I should also be opening in it. Okay. Um, from the top. I wish there was a way, it would feels like it would be helpful if there was a way to sort um, sort these, but so missing doc strings I can live with. Okay, um, so obviously this was a long one, um, and it's not, I mean, let, let's be honest here, 137 problems is still too much for me to to get a, like a good grip on. Um, I, I am going to want to handle these at some point, but, and again, I'd rather not have the crap scared out of me by, um, <laughs> by, uh, um, you know, my pie suddenly saying you don't you don't return anything. Um, but I think I'm going to do just one last sort of run to make sure. Yeah, it's all dock strings. I think I just closed the wrong one. Ah, I'm tired. <laughs> Okay, so whatever mystery caused my pie to freak out there, um, it does not seem to be the case anymore. So um, I'm going to add all of these.
I'm going to sink because I think it's very unlikely that after three hours of this and then the two that I, the two and change that I did before, I think maybe I will save part 11 for, um, <laughs> for tomorrow. But um, I'm hoping this wasn't too, oh, okay, yeah, the executables here. So I hope this wasn't too un unpleasant for folks. I think what I'll, I, I'm sure there's a way that I can get like a third window up. I figure I'll put this up as like an intermission um, for people who are kind of interested in seeing. I, again, I don't really know why people would be interested in it, but I, I've recorded the other stuff. Um, I guess the only thing that I can say is like for all of the effort that I put in here, uh, I did make some decisions that I don't like. Um, so... You know, I, I have a feeling that these rules will be a little bit more helpful for me um, the next time I start a fresh project. And what I think I might start doing is sort of taking some notes. It's very clear that the really wide net is not, um, not the way to go long term. Um, and I'm obviously going to want to change my preferences for at least one of the doc string ones. But... Uh, yeah, I think that will probably be the next thing that I do. I think it would be sensible for me to um, adjust the rough preferences so that uh, it suppresses stuff like, you know, cryptographically secure random number generation in the context of a video game. Like, silliness. Like, it's, it's good that it's an option in there. Um, it is completely inappropriate for, um, for this situation. Anyways been three hours. Uh, I hope you enjoyed whatever it was you were doing while doing this, and we'll see you for part 11. Take care.